the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. <coughs> May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of The Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of The American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Oscar R. Ewing, Federal Security Administrator. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Ewing, our chronoscope audience knows you, sir, as one of the more controversial figures in Washington. They know that your opponents charge that you are an advocate of state medicine. Now, tonight, we would particularly like to question you on your plan to include the uh, hospitalization benefits in the old age security program. Now, will you state for us, sir, uh, an explanation for that plan as briefly as possible? Well, Mr. Huey, the uh, plan proposes to include uh, among the benefits uh, that go to the people who are entitled to old age and survivors benefit, b benefits, that is, those from whom wage deductions have been taken, paid into the fund, uh, that there be a hospitalization insurance. It would cover, by 1953, about uh, 7 million people. There would be about 5.5 million people over 55, uh, over 65, about a million 100,000 dependent children, and roughly 400,000 widows and people who are taking care of those children. The whole idea is that uh, we can give that hospitalization insurance up to 60 days without having to take out any additional wage deductions. Our present uh, financing uh, will meet that. Uh, the program would uh, work very simply. Uh, if a man, uh, one of these people entitled to it, became sick and his doctor decided he needed hospitalization, the doctor would arrange it. We don't guarantee he gets into a hospital. Uh, but if it is arranged, we do take care of the expense. It would help. Well, Mr. Ewing, what would that cost about the program, <coughs> you figure? Well, our estimates, Mr. Hazlitt, are about $200 million a year. Uh, it may be a little more or a little less. Well, you say you don't have to increase present taxes to get no, that. No, because this cost uh, would be about, uh, if we were having a special wage deduction for it, it would be less than two-tenths of one percent, one-tenth by the employer and one-tenth by the employee. <coughs> well, our present financing can take care of that. Now, uh, the, the, present, uh, the present rate is uh, one and a half for On each, the employer uh, and one and a half, half on the employee, a total yeah. of three. And uh, you don't think it would pay to postpone uh, the increase in the rates instead of putting in a new program, using the money for a new program? No, I do not, because uh, I think the, these are so small, this, this program, relatively speaking, the cost is so small that it can be taken care of without any interference with the overall plan that's already been made. To simplify, Mr. Ewing, our audience uh, understands that there is an argument now over whether we shall extend federal security, federal government security, or whether we shall attempt to limit it. Now, you are one of the ones who believes that we should extend the federal security program. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Mr. Huey, I'm a firm believer in social insurance. That is where people, through wage deductions or other means, uh, pay into an insurance program and get the benefits back. I am not one for one minute to advocate payments of these things out of general taxes. Well, let's, uh, our, our people uh, understand that, uh, or have heard a great deal about the British system and about uh, socialization of medicine in Britain. Now, uh, is it your view, sir, that uh, 
Do you approve that system, that British system, and that you would like to see ultimately such a system in the United States? No, the, that, there are many differences between our proposal for national health insurance and what the British proposed. For, uh, the big difference, uh, Mr. Huey, is that uh, the British pay eight-ninths of the cost out of general taxes, and we wouldn't pay a penny out of general you're, taxes. You're not in favor of paying for any of these services out of general no, taxes? Sir. No, sir. Well, Mr. Ewing, I, as I recall, in 1948, when you put forward your larger program, you yourself estimated that that program would cost something like four to six billion dollars a year. That's right. And that in 1960, it would be up to ten billion dollars a year. Now, uh, have you... No, uh, I don't recall a lot. Well, anyway, but yeah. anyway, it was four to six billion yeah. around that neighborhood. <clears throat> now, have you retreated from that program, or is this step one in a new program, or what is it? How do you conceive this? No, I have program? not retreated one uh, inch mm -hmm. on that. I have in my own advocacy of it, my own belief that it's a desirable thing to do. However, what I'm proposing here is not uh, a substitute, nor is it a retreat from that at all. It's simply that here is a particular group that people over 65 years of age who have uh, more sickness than the average, who have less money with which to pay for it, and who have less money with which to buy voluntary insurance. And I'm, I would urge this program in order to take care of them. Now, you already have the money. I mean, the government is collecting the money to cover this. Yes. Uh, you are collecting more money than you are now spending under the federal uh, Social Security program. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Uh, to be quite accurate, we, uh, it's always been expected in the early years that we would collect more than we'd spend, building up to the time when the uh, expenses uh, would about equal the income. Uh, but uh, I, the point that I'm making is that the income has exceeded our expectations, uh, and the, whereas the outgo has not. Well, there will be some inflationary effect, won't there, of this program, that is to say it will mean more expenditures than otherwise? Yes, Mr. Hazlitt, there will be some, ex uh, there will be some, uh, uh, to the extent that it represents new uh, expenditures for people who would not get the hospitalization otherwise, it would be inflationary, to the extent it merely takes the place of the uh, money that they would otherwise pay out of their own pockets or what, it, it would not be. But on the other hand, you've got to balance that against yes. the social gains yes. uh, that come from <coughs> well, uh, now, this hospitalization. I believe the present estimate is that present expenditures will be somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 billion this year, since this fiscal year, and that we're going to run into a deficit of somewhere in the neighborhood of $7 billion, if I remember the official estimates. Now, in view of that uh, situation, do you think this is the proper time, the, the most appropriate time to be pressing for increased expenditures by the federal government? <coughs> yes, because this comes out of a fund that's, uh, that's already in existence. This money is being collected now, and uh, it, it has no, uh, no relation to the general overall tax program and, uh, and budgetary figures at all. Well, it has in relation to the money that would be spent, and your argument is that this that would be offset by the humane aspect of it. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the health aspect. Is the war exactly. a factor, sir? Uh, a great many Americans feel that while we're spending so much money <coughs> prosecuting the Korean War and, and trying to prevent a war with Russia, a great many Americans feel that we should cut down on uh, other expenditures by the government. Now, uh, you, you think that at least to this extent of $200 million that we should increase expenditures by the federal government. These now. are not expenditures by the federal government. These are fun monies paid out of an insurance fund that these people have paid into. But it is an expenditure by a federal agency. Well, it's money spent. Sure, it's money spent. Money, if a private insurance company spends money, it's money spent. Yes, but uh, you're going to spend money. You're, you're now putting that I'm money in government it, bonds, I'm not you? taking it out of the taxpayers of the country at all. The, the, this money comes out of funds that have been paid into the Social Security Fund. Well, now, what are you doing <coughs> with, with the surplus money? You are now buying war bonds with it, a yes, government bond, aren't you? that's true. Now, you will have $200 million <coughs> a year less to invest in government bonds, that won't true. you, sir? Well, let me put the problem this way, Mr. Ewing. At present, you say we can afford to pay this $200 million, or rather the government can, because otherwise the monies that come in are not being spent. But what assurance have we that there won't be soon demands for increasing the benefits under the old age uh, uh, insurance itself? Well, you have no insurance because you're perfectly sure that they will be. There will always be pressures to increase those benefits as long as, uh, as uh, we live. 
uh, and it depends on the good judgment of Congress to keep the uh, benefits uh, in line with the income, and so far Congress has done an admirable job on it. You don't uh, regard yourself as a socialist, do you, sir? <coughs> Definitely not. I haven't the slightest sympathy with socialism. Well, now I'd like to ask one uh, final question, Mr. Ewing, and, and to sum up, you point is that this uh, program will cost only about $200 million a year, uh, that it isn't in any respect an entering wedge for uh, a larger program, and it doesn't bring you back, and it's to be considered on its own merits and wholly apart from your previous proposal of a program that would cost from four to six billion dollars. That's, that's right. That's about... And even the larger program, Mr. Hazlitt, would, uh, would uh, uh, be self-supporting it. There would be a special tax for that. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Oscar R. Ewing, Federal Security Administrator. As the regular football season comes to an end, fans look forward to the spectacular postseason championship bowl games, which have now become an established tradition. If you own a Longines watch, or if you're hinting that you'd like to own one come Christmas time, you can take pride in the fact that in football, where time is such a vital factor, Longines watches are used almost exclusively for official timing. Longines timed the football games for more than 100 leading colleges during the season, as well as the games of the National Professional Football League. And practically every one of the postseason championship bowl games will also be Longines timed. From the Rose Bowl in California to the Orange Bowl in Miami, as well as the National Football League Professional Championship. If this Christmas you wish to give just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, let your choice be the watch of great prestige, Longines, honored for accuracy in sport as in other fields of precise timing, honored for elegance and elegance by 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards. And you may buy and give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.